Thanks for dropping by and welcome to Solve Crime's new series, They Killed Their Parents. One thing we want to make clear is that we will attempt to tell stories of interest in the true crime genre, not to glorify these killers or their horrible acts. The videos in this and other series will be documentary style for those of you who find true crime fascinating and intriguing. In between the cases that we are actively investigating, we'll be posting true crime content like this. We hope you find them interesting and entertaining. Let us know in the comments if you like this particular series and want us to make more. You can also let us know if you have any specific requests and we'll absolutely look into it. By the title alone, you can tell that this is a pretty dark topic and these two convicted parent killers committed acts as dark as you could possibly imagine. We'll first take a look at Edmund Kemper III. We'll be doing a deeper dive on Mr. Kemper in the near future since he was not only a parent killer, but an overall serial killer. So we'll pretty much focus on the topic at hand for this episode. Not only did Ed Kemper kill a parent, he also killed his paternal grandparents when he was just 15 years old. In the second half of this episode, we'll present Diabolical Stew, the story of Joel Guy Jr. This is a more recent case from 2016, with Guy being sentenced just this past October 2020. He murdered both of his parents in Knoxville, Tennessee on November 26, 2016. Then he dismembered them and tried to dissolve all traces of them in a mixture of harsh chemicals, all because his parents planned on cutting him off financially. Buckle up. These are a couple of horrific stories we're about to tell. This is Solve Crimes. Edmund Kemper III. Surprisingly, Edmund Kemper isn't as well known to the general public compared to media sensations like Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy, but his crimes were just as bad and some would say they were worse. Kemper was a serial killer with mommy issues before that was a well-known diagnosis. Many men who specifically target women and are particularly violent towards them had some form of rejection and or abuse from a female figure during their upbringing, usually their mother or early in their young adult life. They seem to take out their frustrations by taking their anger out on innocent women, many who unfortunately resemble their original tormentor. Edmund Kemper was born in 1948 in Burbank, California. He was the middle child of three and showed the now typical early signs of a future serial killer. He took his younger sister's dolls and decapitated them and removed their hands. At age 10, he buried the family cat, alive. Days later, he dug the cat up, decapitated it, and placed its head on a spike. When he was 13, he perceived that another family cat, and by the way, why in the great wide world of sports did they get another cat? Anyhow, he thought the cat liked his sister more than him, so he killed it and kept pieces of the cat in his closet. To give you an idea of the intimidation factor that Kemper possessed, by the time he was 14, he was six foot four inches tall. He would eventually grow to six foot nine inches, quite literally a monster. Ed's relationship with his mother was strained to say the very least. It was severely dysfunctional. Clarnell Kemper was a neurotic alcoholic who constantly belittled and humiliated Ed. Those were the verbal strikes his mother took at him. She was also physically abusive, locking him in the basement and refusing to show him any affection. She actually claimed at one point that showing him affection would somehow turn him gay. Here is Ed Kemper himself in a 1984 interview. You were involved in the campus because your mother worked there. Yes. I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, women, and had had a very strong and violently outspoken position on men. For much of my upbringing. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. And I watched the alcohol increase. I watched her social life drop off. I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life, earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. I hate to distill it down into such uh, 
in the one word realities like that. There's a lot that leads into that happening, but that is what happened. They represented not what my mother was, but what she liked, what she coveted, what was important to her, and I was destroying it. Why did you actually kill the girls? My frustration, my inability to communicate socially, sexually. I wasn't impotent, but emotionally I was impotent. I was scared to death of failing in male-female relationships. I knew absolutely nothing about that whole area. Even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady. I need to be able to really communicate, and ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. Psychologists who have studied this case have speculated that she had borderline personality disorder. If you aren't familiar with BPD, look it up on Wikipedia. It's a doozy of a disorder, and it's one that cannot be treated with drugs or therapy, not unless the afflicted wants to get better. And by the very nature of the disorder, that's very unlikely. Kemper's paternal grandmother, Matilda Kemper, wasn't very different from his mother. She would emasculate him along with her husband, Kemper's grandfather. In 1964, Ed Kemper was 15 and already standing six foot five. Ed was sent by his father to live with his paternal grandparents who lived on a ranch in North Fork, California. Not long after he arrived, he had an argument with his grandmother in the kitchen. Ed stormed out of the kitchen, grabbed a hunting rifle his grandfather had given him, re-entered the kitchen and fatally shot his grandmother in the head. He then fired twice in her back for good measure. Some reports have him even stabbing her several times post-mortem. Kemper's grandfather, who was at the grocery store, soon arrived and Ed fatally shot him in the driveway, saying later that he killed him before he could see what Ed had done to his wife. Psychiatrists diagnosed Kemper with paranoid schizophrenia and sent him to the California Youth Authority at Atascadero, California. The psychiatrists there disagreed with the paranoid schizophrenia diagnosis. They found him to be very intelligent. He scored 136 and 145 on two IQ tests administered there. He was deemed to be a model prisoner who was so trusted that he was allowed to administer psych tests to other inmates. It has been reported that an outside caseworker who was consulted when Kemper was considered for parole in 1969 warned administrators at Atascadero not to release Kemper back to his mother's custody because he hated her and showed violent tendencies toward her specifically. Take a wild guess at what happened next. Ed Kemper was released on parole on his 21st birthday on December 18th to his mother's custody. By then, his mother was living in Aptos, California, a small beach town suburb of Santa Cruz. Clarnell was working as an administrative assistant at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Kemper convinced his psychiatrist that he was rehabilitated. So in November of 1972, his juvenile records were permanently expunged. The relationship with his mother was still very toxic, but Ed enrolled in community college and actually tried to become a police officer but he was rejected because of his size. Between May of 1972 and March of 1973, Ed Kemper killed five college students and one high school student. These victims were later believed to be surrogates for his ultimate target, his mother. After his apprehension, Kemper recalled thinking over and over again, she's gotta die. On April 20th, 1972, Clarnell came home late from a party, waking Ed. While she was reading a book in bed, Kemper sat at the end of it. His mother then said sarcastically, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now, throwing her book down. Kemper replied, no, good night. Later, after she fell asleep, Ed Kemper went into her room, bludgeoned her with a claw hammer and slit her throat. Here's where I should warn you that this is pretty disturbing. He then decapitated her and engaged in irumatio with her head. I'm going to let you look that one up on your own. Next, he put her severed head on a shelf and screamed at it for over an hour and threw darts at his mother's head. He then smashed her face in, ripped out her tongue and larynx, and put them down the garbage disposal. The tough tissue of the larynx was ejected back into the sink. Later, Kemper would say, that seemed appropriate as much as she'd bitched and screamed and yelled at me over so many years. Ed then stuffed his mother's body in a closet and invited his mother's best friend, Sally Hallett, over to watch a movie and have dinner with his mother. When Hallett arrived, Kemper strangled her to death in order to create a cover story 
that his mother and her friend had left town together on vacation. He quickly cleaned up the apartment, left a note for police, and drove nonstop to Pueblo, Colorado after taking caffeine pills to stay awake. Kemper was surprised when he didn't hear of the murders on the radio and ended up calling Santa Cruz police and confessing. But they didn't believe him, telling him to call back later. He called back several hours later and asked for an officer he knew by name. This time, police picked him up and Ed confessed to the two killings as well as the six students. In November of 1973, Edmund Kemper was sentenced to seven years to life for each of the murders. He has been eligible for parole many times over the years, but has waived his right to a hearing several of those and has been denied parole several more. As of June of 2021, Ed Kemper is 73 years old and imprisoned at California Medical Facility in Vacaville, California. He is next eligible for parole in 2024. Joel Guy Jr. It was Thanksgiving 2016, and the Guy family of Knoxville, Tennessee, were having all four of their children, three girls from Guy Sr.'s previous marriage, and one boy from the couple's 31-year marriage, home for the holiday. It was to be their last family holiday in that house because Joel Guy Sr., 61, and his wife Lisa Guy, 55, had recently put their home on the market and were planning their retirement. Unfortunately, it was to be the last family holiday ever. Their son, 28-year-old Joel Guy Jr., had attended George Washington University for one semester and then had transferred to LSU, Louisiana State University, and was living in Baton Rouge at the time, coming home for the special holiday. Word is that he wanted to be a plastic surgeon. The couple's only biological child apparently wasn't living up to his father's expectations. Guy Jr. had never worked in his 28 years and was apparently a major financial drain on his parents. In fact, his parents had decided that during the holiday season, they were letting Jr. know that he was officially cut off financially. Only a couple of his half-sisters knew about it, but somehow he found out. Guy Jr.'s sisters left after Thanksgiving dinner and they were surprised to hear that he was going to stay through the weekend with his parents. On Saturday, November 26th, two days after Thanksgiving, Joel Guy Jr. waited until his mother went shopping at the local Walmart. That's when he attacked his father with a knife while Sr. was exercising. There was a struggle. An overturned Bowflex machine, torn window blinds, and blood on the wall. Jr. cut away his father's clothing before he started dismembering him. Sr.'s hands were removed and were found near the exercise room. When Junior's mother, Lisa Guy, returned from shopping, she put the bags down inside on the floor of the foyer and headed upstairs, where she was also attacked with a knife by Junior. She was attacked so severely that nine of her ribs were severed. Her clothes were also cut off of her, as well as her head. He carried her severed head by the hair and took it downstairs and into the kitchen, where it was placed in a boiling pot of water on the stove. Yes, the pot on the thumbnail graphic for this episode is an actual photo of the pot taken from a crime scene photo. Both victims had their arms and legs removed and Guy Sr. was also severed at the waist. Junior then placed his parents' body parts in a big tub of corrosive chemicals, hence the diabolical stew reference, in an attempt to dissolve their bodies. In the attacks, Junior sustained several wounds. He could later be seen on security cameras at Walmart purchasing bandages and hydrogen peroxide. The next day, so he apparently slept just fine in the family home Saturday night with both of his parents dissolving in tubs and in a pot on the stove, he drove back to Baton Rouge and sought treatment for his wounds at the student clinic on campus. On Monday, a coworker of Mrs. Guy became worried when she didn't show up for work and she could not reach her. She knew something was wrong, so she called 911 and requested a well check at the Guy house. Knox County Sheriff arrived at the home and once they made entrance, immediately smelled something awful. Before he left, Junior had set the thermostat to 90 degrees and even turned on a few space heaters. The temperature in the house was 93 degrees, 
and had been running at that temperature for at least two days. Detective Jeremy McCord described the scene in the home as the most horrific thing he'd ever seen in law enforcement and in life. Detective McCord went on to say that the smell is never going to leave him. The following day, Tuesday, Joel Guy Jr., who had been under surveillance since the day before, was apprehended as he was getting into his 2006 Hyundai Sonata in the parking lot of his apartment building in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. There was a meat grinder in the trunk. Junior was charged with premeditated murder after a super creepy handwritten journal was found in his backpack. The parent killer's notes included some of the following. Money all mine, one note read. I get the whole thing. Get carving knives. Get killing knives. Quiet, multiple, to make small pieces. Get sledgehammer. Crush bones. Bring blender and food grinder. Grind meat. Get bleach. Get plastic bin for denaturation process. Does not matter where they're killed. Just get rid of bloody spots to prevent evidence of time of death. No mattress or couches. Get rid of bodies inside house. There and my DNA already there. Flush chunks down toilet, not garbage disposal. He needs to be blamed, not intruder. Get plastic sheeting for disposal process. Use computer room gun. Check to make sure there are bullets. Last resort. He's not alive to claim her half of insurance. Money all mine, $500,000. Flood the house, covers up forensic evidence. Turn heater up as high as it goes, speeds decomposition. Bleach reacts with luminol just like blood. Douse area with bleach. Big sprayer, lie. Trash compactor, body gives time of death, alibi. Don't have to get rid of body if there is no forensic evidence. Guy Jr. pled not guilty at trial, yet he also filed a motion that he be given the death penalty if convicted. That motion was denied. It was only a four day trial. The defense counsel presented zero evidence. Guy Jr. was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. He was even convicted of abusing a corpse. On a side note, in the published obituary for Guy Sr. and his wife Lisa, only the three girls are listed as descendants. Guy Jr. is now 33 years old and will spend the rest of his life in prison. He's currently being held at Bledsoe County Correctional Complex in Pikeville, Tennessee. Thanks so much for watching. One thing that makes this channel a bit different is that we are actually involved in investigating and making every effort to solve these cases. This is real stuff we're reporting on here. So when we say that liking our videos, subscribing and sharing helps, it's not about money. It's about getting these cases in front of more people and hopefully getting some closure and even justice in some cases for the families of these victims. We really do appreciate you liking this video and subscribing. Click the bell to be alerted for more episodes when they're uploaded. Until next time, this is Solve Crimes.